Welcome, uh, welcome to the pre-recording of a lecture 11, or uh, lecture 35 of MCS 481. So uh, this is scheduled for the end of the 12th week. Um, in the previous lecture, we introduced um, convex hulls in three-dimensional space. We proved the complexity um, and today we are going to consider algorithms to construct uh, convex hulls in tree space. So in the last lecture we shown that the complexity of a convex hull is linear in the number of vertices. This will allow for the potential of n log n algorithms. So it's good to keep that in mind. Um, okay, so let's uh, start with uh, a running example. So to introduce the notion of an incremental algorithm, we start with a tetrahedron. Um, so this picture, by the way, is made with sage mat. Uh, so we see in uh, green um, a polyhedron that is a generalization of a triangle to three space uh, so it's also called a simplex so we have a triangle as base and then we have one extra vertex and three extra facets another way of saying this it is a pyramid with a triangular base so this is our initial uh, tetrahedron um, so the algorithm will look for essentially four points that are not all lying in the plane. So constructing this initial tetrahedron is important to check whether your point configuration is proper in tree space. Uh, so just like when you have... Uh, three random points you don't want them to be on a line if you have uh, like here eight points in three space you actually don't want that they all lie in the plane if that is the case then we go back to our first chapter so then we where we started convex hulls in the plane okay we have our initial tetrahedron so you can see that the points were ordered such that uh, the first four points lied in the uh, plane. So the fourth point is not a good choice. So it's lying over here. Uh, so instead we pick 1, 1, 1, uh, the fifth point in this list of eight. Okay, so then we are adding the fourth point. Uh, so now we see we have... A pyramid, a proper pyramid with a square uh, base, um, so going from the left to the right. Our next point adds another point uh, at level 1, so that's the point 2, 1, 1. So that point um, lies... Um, is one of these two here well it's actually this point um, so and then we adding the next to last point so which is the third point that we add to the convex hull starting from the fourth point uh, fr from the tetrahedron the third point so now we have processed seven points so now we have a pyramid um, so we started with a pyramid with a triangular base then we had a square base then we the square base stays uh, so then the the picture here at the left has a top that is a vertex now our top is actually a triangle and in the end we find a pyramid with a square base and a square top so the square at the base uh, every side has length three 
the top square there every edge has length one okay i will at the end of the lecture show how you can do this with the python bindings in seagull in the previous lecture i mentioned the spatial module of um, the spatial module of scipy today we are going to the python bindings of seagull Okay, so that is the intuition um, or the idea of adding points to a convex hull, incrementally building the convex hull. Okay, um, first question, if you are adding points one after the other, then what could go wrong? Uh, well, what could go wrong is that the facets that you just added you're going to destroy again so if you look at this example we see six facets so one base facet and then one top and then four sides what would be the worst point uh, that you could pick well you could uh, pick uh, one point uh, sufficiently high that would if you consider the convex hull that would remove five facets except the base um, so you can think of an input like this so that's the first exercise so if you would add that point as the last point then actually you would uh, create new facets and then remove facets so this would lead to a very inefficient construction we have covered randomization many times in this course already why does randomization work well the very pathological case where you have to destroy most of your facets and edges as well that is pathological so and there are n factorial ways how to order your points so the good example here is just listing for this extra input one vertex that is high enough and indicating that spelling out very clearly that uh, the five five of the six facets would actually be replaced in any other order uh, provided for example if that top vertex that very top vertex was the first was within your initial tetrahedron then you will see that many of the points already lie in the convex hull okay so here is then our first algorithm so when we write an algorithm uh, we think of a good name um, here it's obvious um, we also specify the input and the output the input is a set of points uh, typically n points uh, the number of points is our main dimension we will use the doubly connected edge list to store the convex hull um, we are assuming that the points are in general position so they are random points uh, so that implies that every uh, facet will be a triangle now we will see how uh, seagull deals with uh, cases such as our example where actually every uh, facet has four vertices uh, so in some sense our first example was similar to to the cube uh, the cube is not a simplicial polytope but it is a simple polytope every vertex has degree three okay so here is our uh, algorithm then um, we will do this with iterative uh, stepwise refinement so we have three main stages first we check whether the points are not coplanar so if they that is actually a tetrahedron the initial tetrahedron um, i think that was a subroutine that we discussed in the previous lecture um, 
then the randomization is important uh, so we will permute the remaining points we have solved the first exercise and then we will loop over all the remaining points that are permuted now a facet changes if the facet is visible from the added point so here is then the visibility definition so here is a picture uh, of our uh, running example for the polyhedron um, you have a point and a facet um, so the top facet is here focused so imagine a plane that passes through the facet the facet lies here entirely the top facet f lies entirely in this green plane then the point p will be visible um, visible um, from so the facet will be visible from the point p if the point lies on one side of the uh, plane the green plane now that green plane also defines a half plane so we look at a polytope as defined by a doubly connected edge list by facets and edges and vertices but you can also describe a um, polytope as the intersection of a finite number of half planes so given then a polytope and the point we define the horizon of the point on the polytope as the border between the visible and the non-visible facets of this polytope so here in blue on the example uh, we see the visible uh, facets the facets that are visible from the point uh, p and um, the second exercise asks why all the edges of the visible facets are included in the horizon this is not so obvious here can it be that of a facet you would see only part of it you would all see only certain edges so how come that you all of a sudden see the entire facet um this has to do you can explain this via the linear inequalities so whether the point actually is outside or inside the half plane is a strict inequality and this happens actually with all the points that are lying inside the plane okay so um, let's focus now on the first stages in the algorithm um, so we had three stages um, the initial tetrahedron the randomize and then the processing of all the points so the first two stages are here spelled out a little bit so our initial tetrahedron is defined by the first four points so here in some sense uh, we are assuming that the points in general position so the case whether the points whether all points lie in the same plane is not going to happen um, so in some sense this algorithm makes some assumptions um, if this were to happen the find initial tetrahedron would actually fail to produce four points um, so um, one can make the find initial tetrahedron more robust so the construction of the initial tetrahedron so the first stage in the algorithm is split here in two so in the second phase of the initial tetrahedron a doubly connected edge list will be constructed so this will be our first convex hull 
Then we have the set of the remaining points. So we remove the four points that span the initial tetrahedron and we randomize that collection. Now we have to decide whether a point belongs to the convex hull or not. And for that, we can maintain the half space uh, representation. So each time when we compute a facet, so for every facet we have a linear inequality. So deciding whether a point can be thrown away or not is then by evaluating the linear inequalities. Okay, so that's this test uh, number seven here. Um, so we will only process the points when they do not satisfy the inequalities of the half planes. So we will then determine all the horizon. So for every facet that is seen from by the point, we add all the edges to the horizon. So these are actually the facets that also have to be removed. So in the new convex hull, we will remove the facets and we will add uh, to the convex hull all the edges. So the edges in the horizon plus the new point that is actually defining a new facet. So you should think of a pyramid construction where the top of the pyramid is the point that doesn't belong yet to the convex hull. So the Kate point doesn't belong to the convex hull and we construct, we add the pyramids defined by the edges of the horizon and the new point. So, and again, it is in generic uh, general position. Uh, the point set is in general position, so all the facets are triangles. Okay, so um, we are halfway through uh, with the slides, but actually we have our first incremental algorithm and it is randomized. Okay, so we could stop, but we can't uh, because um, it doesn't take long to realize uh, that it's actually not an algorithm that is good enough because it has a quadratic cost, quadratic in the number of points. And one can see this very quickly. If you maintain the half space representation, then that half space representation will be linear in the number of facets. So for every facet, you will have four coefficients that you store. So this, there's this constant four. And we have shown last time that the complexity of a convex hull has, is linear in the number of facets. So the list of linear inequalities grows linearly. So, and you have already, so there is a, there is a loop uh, in the test seven, that's the inner loop. And then there is the outer loop. Now there are also other loops with the horizon. So, but already in step seven, in the decision whether you have to process a point or not, there already you run in the quadratic cost. Okay, so that's why we will not consider this algorithm. However, our efforts were not in vain. Uh, we will modify this algorithm. In some sense, the algorithm that we have covered is a good base, and we will improve it. How? By introducing the conflict graph. The conflict graph will allow for an efficient computation of the horizon. And that will lead to our second algorithm. Okay, let's uh, look at the half space uh, representation of a facet. So every facet defines a half space. 
So every point on the plane through the facets makes uh, the same inner product with the normal vector. So you may say, why do you say this now again? So we have talked about the half space representation. Well, when we talked about the horizon, so this is a similar picture as the horizon, we were looking at the points from the point to the facet. But we can actually also look at it differently. So we can look from the facet to the points. So when we have a polytope, for every new face that we add, we can already investigate whether that face sees the other points or not. Rather, also another way of saying, uh, does the point actually make uh, a positive inner product with the vector from um, any, so if you imagine, so here you can also see the pyramid construction, uh, the point P uh, will, when it gets added to this polytope here, will actually replace the blue edges and with every blue edge and the red point here there is a new facet. So if you follow, if you now imagine the dashed lines, there are arrows, there are vectors, then actually they will make a positive in a product uh, with the normal vector to the facet. So you can decide uh, with plain vector calculus, if you like, whether points are actually visible from a facet or not. So we change our point of view. In the previous algorithm, we had a new point and we're looking down on the faces. Here actually we have a, our facets that are new and we are looking up to the points. Okay, so it's also you could say you look ahead. Uh, rather than passively uh, building your half space representation and then use that whenever there is a new point coming in, we actually already know all the points that we are going to process. So we can actually compute those points that are conflicting with a facet. So as soon as we have a new facet, we will actually compute all the points that are not in the half plane that is um, defined by the new uh, facet. So uh, we can look from the facets to the points, the points that are on conflict with the facet. But we can build, uh, we, we can define also the other way around. So for every point, we can also actually list the facets they are in conflict with. So if we know, uh, so in other words, if we know the points that are in conflict with the facets, we also know for every point which facets it's in conflict with. So you can use this point of view in both ways. Um, so when we compute the facets, we will compute the points, the conflicted points. And when we are processing the points, we will look to the facets it's in conflict with. So there is no more, uh, it's, it's, it's a much faster lookup in some sense. Here is the relationship is in conflict with defines a bipartite graph. At one side you have the points and on the other side all the facets. And there is an edge between the nodes if there is a conflict. Either the point is in conflict with the facet or the facet is in conflict with the point. So it is an undirected bipartite graph, the conflict graph. 
So in some sense, data structures are extremely important in this course. Uh, so this is another um, illustration of this. So we will not investigate the complexity of this second algorithm now, but it will not have the same problem as the first algorithm. That's the main point. So the, 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 the main point of, well, the, there is the, uh, we had already a point. So there is the uh, randomization and the incremental aspect. But uh, the other second point, if you like, is this bipartite conflict graph. Okay, so how do we update uh, the conflict graph? Um, so we have an edge between the point and the facet. If uh, you can see the point from the facet, then that will uh, determine the conflict. So the, the, the main point here in updating this conflict graph, uh, the graph, by the way, can be represented simply by a matrix. Uh, so we know in advance how many points we have. So these could be the rows and then the columns can be uh, the facets that we have. So we have a Boolean matrix, matrix of zeros and ones. So this is how you could store it. So it is a much more efficient uh, data structure that solves the membership problem. So the determination of the visibility that can be done with uh, this uh, vector calculus. So for the points on the facets, we can compute the normal, and uh, for the we can take the inner product of that normal vector with the vectors from the vertex to the point, and that visibility test is a primitive operation. So that is actually an exercise that I could add here. Um, if P is visible from the, the facet, that is actually um, a primitive operation. Now you could say that, look, you, you still have to do this a linear number of times. Uh, so because uh, there is still a linear uh, number of, um, of facets, but uh, the idea is that uh, the number of facets we destroy and create, that actually remains uh, linear. Okay, so uh, let's now conclude with the formal definition of our second algorithm. So the second algorithm is in some sense exactly identical, at least at the beginning, to our first algorithm. So the first four steps are identical. In the fifth step, so that is what is new, we will initialize uh, for the facets of the tetrahedron, so the four facets, we will initialize the conflict graph. And again, uh, we have a primitive operation to determine whether a facet sees the point. Okay, then uh, how do we um, add points? Well, for all the points, and actually the point P here, um, so this should have been PK. Um, so if there are so the, the, the membership test is actually now replaced if there is no edge from the point to the uh, facets it's a, it is in conflict with. And that can be stored very efficiently, by the way. Then actually you don't do anything. Um, so if there are conflicts, so if this conflict is not... Um, not empty, then what you will do is you will remove from your doubly connected edge list all the facets uh, that uh, it is in conflict with. 
So the horizon exists, uh, then is defined by all the edges of the conflicted facets. And with the doubly connected edge list, there is an order. Um, so we loop over all these edges and we and the new facets are the are spanned by the edges in the horizon, that list of uh, conflicted edges and the new point. Um, so there is no correctness proof here. Um, so but the a uh, data structure of a doubly connected edge list is actually kind of uh, critical here. Um, also for simplicity, we assume that our polytopes are simplicial. So um, we have only triangles. Okay, I'm almost to the end. Uh, well, actually not yet. Um, Okay, so I actually had uh, the assumption in general position, uh, but here we may end up uh, with coplanar facets. Uh, so if the uh, we say that facets are coplanar, uh, then actually there is an inner edge. So our data structure when we have facets that are spanned by four points, they have actually an edge that lies inside uh, a face, totally inside a face, and that is handled here. Okay, um, our third exercise is to work with a cube. Um, so the cube is actually a simple polytope, but not simplicial. So in some sense, the case 12 will occur, but you could also try to see what happens when we run this with Seagull, as I will try to explain uh, now. Okay, so I'm actually done with the essence of uh, this uh, lecture. Um, in one sentence, we have considered a randomized incremental algorithm that uses a conflict graph to efficiently compute the horizon. And the horizon is defined of all the edges that are visible from the new point, if you look from the new point to the polytope. Okay, so the exercises one, two, and three are very important. I try to hand wavingly solve them. Uh, but it's important that this can be done. Uh, the purpose of the lectures is that you can read the textbook. Um, so also consider the exercises listed there. And in the remaining five minutes or so, I'm going to very quickly browse through the Seagull documentation. So um, here is the package overview of Seagull. Um, if you notice, um, convex hulls are quite essential. So they occur very quickly. So right after the kernels, um, you have the convex hull algorithms. So for us, uh, what is relevant are the three dimensional convex hulls. So introduced in Seagull. 1.1. Um, also, it depends on the three-dimensional triangulations for the dynamic um, algorithms. Uh, we will see that uh, on our running example, Seagull will actually triangulate the faces. Um, so here is then the user manual. Um, so you can see a nice picture and then the convex hull similar to uh, making a veil uh, around uh, the uh, figure here. So again, the convex hull where it is used here for. Um, so there are static and there are dynamic convex hulls algorithm. So actually the convex hull tree provides an implementation of quick hull. Um, so convex hull, convex underscore hull tree 
is actually wrapped um, so I will uh, try to illustrate this so it is wrapped in uh, the SWIG uh, bindings um, so there is the static convex hull algorithm uh, that is actually using quick hull um, so quick hull q hull also is implemented in q hull uh, the uh, scipy um, implementation wraps essentially q hull uh, from the previous step so um, there is the static so you can do the half space in intersection um, perhaps I will come back at this at a later point although this could be also good for a final exam question um, going from the uh, point representation you get the convex hull in uh, you get the facets and every facets defines a linear inequality you can by duality go from the a set of linear inequalities and compute the vertices uh, so we went over that for the two-dimensional convex hulls okay so there's also the dynamic convex hull uh, computation so in in some sense we do have a graph uh, that is also coming here that's the face uh, uh, the face graph and then there is the performance uh, there is a final project uh, so if you want to delve in deeper into uh, Seagull and the performance um, you may also ask at this point already uh, if I use SciPy or if I use Seagull is there a difference um, you can find that out in a project Okay, um, last thing I've prepared a um, notebook, a Jupyter notebook, in two parts. Um, so the first part is just a copy of what I found in the examples on the wiki. Um, so it imports polyhedron underscore three. And then you can see that you could construct a polyhedron by adding facets so and uh, you can query that polyhedron so the size of the vertices size of the facets size of the half edges divided by two um, okay so that's the first example uh, that is uh, provided in the wiki for the swig bindings in some sense uh, not so helpful um, but a good start uh, so uh, with some not actually not all that much uh, searching uh, i found that there is a seagull convex underscore hull underscore three notice the capitalization is important we use the camel case but then still uh, there is the uh, we use the snake case as properly in python but then there are still uh, convex hull uh, capitalized so there is somehow a hybrid so um, we had our running example from the beginning and at this point uh, it would be very instructive if i uh, put up this uh, picture here so this is the example that we have been considering so this is the picture you see the coordinates 0 0 3 0 0 0 3 0 and then 3 3 0 oh actually 3 3 0 is over here um, so uh, that is our running example that we're going to compute with Seagull now so I have uh, made the list in two sub lists so the base um, list A and then the top uh, list B so these are the points that are in the list at first I was thinking that one can give that list of points to the convex underscore hull underscore tree uh, function that is in that um, that is wrapped 
uh, that doesn't work uh, because you have to give a range. Um, now a range um, is uh, also provided in the point underscore three underscore vector. People who have worked with uh, um, so it's a vector of points and you can uh, reserve, reserve I was saying uh, if you ever worked with the C++ standard template um, library then a vector you can reserve space for eight um, points here so I take the list of points uh, so the points by the way they are from the data structures from Seagull I will add this and then this PTS the point underscore three underscore vector that PTS um, instance is actually good enough for the range. Um, and uh, the second, it's not really obvious, it's P. Well, what can P be in this context other than a polyhedron? So I make a polyhedron object and that is passed. So that will encapsulate so that will be used as the handle to the doubly connected edge list data structure so we can query this so there are 12 facets and in some sense this is already a little bit suspicious because hey i count six facets how come seagal finds 12 now there are eight vertices and I recognize that indeed all the input points there are uh, they are vertices. They are shuffled in an other order. Then let's look at all the edges. Uh, so here you see the edges uh, that we found. Um, so it uh, looks also a little bit uh, that uh, the edges uh, we seem to have too many. Uh, notice the orientation here. So for the edges, uh, we seem to be circling around. So um, what Seagal does, it actually triangulates the facets. So we have six facets in this picture, but every facet here has four vertices. So you can imagine the edges that are triangulate every facet. And that is actually what has happened. Um, so the edges, so the first triplet, actually, you can see that it actually runs around. Um, then actually it doesn't really run around for the next edges. Um, so if you look at uh, the facets, we count uh, 12 facets. But you can recognize uh, the triangulation. So for the base, for example, facets four and five, uh, they represent a triangulation of the base. So uh, you have the edges zero, 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 three, zero, three in one facet. And then you have zero, 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 three, zero. And they both have the, the other point as well. So here is this is the triangulation of the base. Okay, so I hope uh, that uh, this was a good introduction to the algorithms for computing convex hulls incrementally by updating your data structures one at a time. In the next lecture, we will see applications of the convex hull. In particular, if you know how to construct a convex hull, then you know how to do a Voronoi diagram. You know how to do a Delaunay triangulation. So that is the reason why um, the spatial module in SciPy has enough on quick hull um, to provide uh, the Voronoi diagrams and the Delaunay triangulation. So that will be explained in the next lecture with the uh, outline of the cost analysis. Um, so a main result that we still have to state, so I'm stating it now, is that the cost of constructing convex hulls is the same as the cost of sorting points in time and log n. 
good with done with data structures, so with this conflict graph. That kind of captures the essence of the horizon. Okay, again, I hope that this was interesting and I will stop here.